Watercress. Three guards guided Watercress to the center of a formation toward the front of the company. Eight golden soldiers protected Watercress with the Major General to his side, and the next highest ranking knights filled in the other positions. By the time a horn blew, alerting the crusade party to advance, Watercress had adjusted to his lack of personal space within the formation. A captain in the front row navigated the entire party. Watercress recognized the color coding of the ribbons on his chest as the rank F7. The man fumbled with the maps, attempting to ensure they went in the correct direction. He scrutinized the key and muttered under his breath in agitation. So far, there had only been one way to go. However, once they came upon a fork in the road, Watercress worried F7 would mislead them. Watercress had inquired as to what the planned route of travel was, but initially F7 had refused to answer him. After some coaxing and the Major General's approval, Watercress received an answer. The crusade would march east and make its first stop in the small village of Tihal. They would take the merchant road through a couple more veteranese towns into the kingdom of Ikasu. Reinforcements would meet with them at Ikasu's capital Trelia and Gia's capital Yael. Watercress knew the way until Ikasu. Past that, he was unsure, but he could read a map and use a sextant. Yet, if F7 proved inept to lead, Watercress was unsure if the captain would have enough confidence in himself to allow Watercress to render his purpose useless. I can only hope F7 would value the king's wishes above his pride if the time comes. For now, there was a more critical matter. Sir Naval, Watercress asked after he lost sight of Basil. Did you speak to Low King Citrine about what I told him? Of course, the Major General dismissed. And were the others informed as well? Watercress was wary of the curious glances of the knights surrounding him. No. Watercress spoke with restriction. It would please me to have Basil closer by my side. It benefits the whole militia to keep the two healers separated. Surely you understand that simple stratagem. To lose both in an ambush or an accident would be devastating for the crusade party, D4 said. But it is imperative that I keep an eye over him. I am his master, after all. Primarily to ensure Basil doesn't cross paths with Master Azimuth. The mage isn't marching in front with us. Did the Major General position him somewhere in the middle of the crusade? One of the officers forced a breath through his nose. Watercrest turned to confront the soldier, but none took credit for the rude act. King Citrine made it clear that those were your feelings. However, let me make myself clear. It takes one soldier to complete the task that our low king outlined. It does not necessarily have to be Basil. It could be anyone. They don't even have to be among those King Citrine chose. What matters is that you remain alive. You are the most valuable member of this party. If you fall, we do not have a replacement to prevent disease and infection. If you perish, the High King will strip another region of their healing mage to join our caravan in your place. You understand how devastating that could be. Watercress respected Sir Nabal's reasoning. Unfortunately, he could not accept it. And if there were another, more important reason that Basil's safety should be guaranteed. Watercress knew if this absurd excuse for a crusade march fell victim to an ambush, he might be spared when his apprentice would not be, all because he had lied about the nature of Basil's birth. If D4 only trusted me how important Basil is, he never would have been sent to the rear. Accepting the challenge, the Major General said, If there were such a reason, it would be treasonous not to have informed our low king. It's not an important reason. Watercress backtracked. Then I guess his life isn't as valuable as you've deluded yourself into believing, a brigadier general said. Quickly concocting the lie, Watercress spouted, Basil possesses the same sorcerer and sight abilities that I do. It doesn't matter that he does, but he could supplant me if I die. Why did you not tell King Citrine of this? The Major General asked. I did, but I wanted to protect Basil. It would have given him an unnecessary label, and we had already discovered the Archspawn's identity, so Basil would never need to use his ability. Why, out of all the children I've delivered, would I have selected him? Solely because he was doomed to a slave's life if I did not? No. I would not do something as foolish as to risk training an apprentice who did not possess innate magic when the possibility of a child that did still had a chance to come. That actually makes a lot of sense, F7 injected into the conversation. Judging by the Major General's expression, Watercress knew he thought along similar lines. 
sorcerer's aptitudes shouldn't ignite trouble. Why would it matter if he was known as a sorcerer rather than a wizard? The brigadier general asked. Any group can be targeted as long as they are differentiated. The safest are those who have yet to stand apart from the crowd. Wouldn't Spawn be the safest out of anyone? They control the fate of thousands of lives. That has absolute power, and yet we fear Rysaglai might target them for that exact reason. So we're hiding them away in their regional castles. That is why I claim Basil was average. If nothing else Watercrest said was true, at least those last words were. If the crusade were ambushed by Rysaglai sympathizers, anti-angelist protesters, political rebels, or organized thieves, Mahantri or otherwise, the assailants would eliminate the crusade's sorcerers first. Further, do you not recall the sorcerer eater of this past age, the man who hunted sorcerers and consumed their living flesh for the sake of trying to obtain innate magical abilities? Fine, I'll post a proper guard on him, but we're concentrating our main forces on you. Those are still our orders, the Major General said. And for the love of angels, cease your prodding. At least it's something. We're entering the Gavo region of Vetron. Is everyone prepared for the new weather conditions? Watercress asked. A few of the warriors released a hearty laugh, but it was the Brigadier General who answered, You must excuse them. All of our armor is enchanted to counter extreme weather conditions. Now, if you're concerned about the civilians traveling alongside this convoy, we have no guarantees for them. We won't let them freeze out here, Watercress said. We anticipate that they'll turn back before that happens. If not, they'll die because their own bodies have failed to keep them sufficiently warm, the Brigadier General said with an obnoxious smile. Had Watercrest been a different man, he may have removed a couple of the knight's incisors because of his suggestion. He feared how many innocents would perhaps lose a few digits if they did not succumb to the frost. Basil, do for them what you can. The wretched winter was upon them, and Watercress maladroitly shoved each arm through its respective coat sleeve. Pushing the buttons through the hand-stitched eyelets, Watercress worried how Basil would react to the new conditions. He hadn't wanted Basil ever to leave the temperate environment of Scythica. The cold brought physical pain, and he had tried to protect Basil from it. He had wanted to ensure that Basil never knew agony, but it was a foolish ambition. Watercress envisioned any parent would want the same for their own child, but life would always find ways of being unkind beyond their control. If this were the worst throbbing Basil would endure, it wouldn't be all that terrible, as long as it was attributed to the workings of the planet rather than to any particular individual. For Watercress, he generally disliked extreme temperatures, but he found the snow to be a fascinating natural phenomenon. What was more concerning was leaving the defensive barrier surrounding Scythica. Without it, arc demons could approach Basil. Watercress doubted they would. The arc spawn of old generally lacked interest in the current age's activities. However, it was a possibility, and he still needed to discover the reason why Bontemay had taken an interest in Basil during his last visit to the Cathedral of the Grateful. However, he wouldn't be able to pursue that answer until he drifted away from the ring of nights surrounding him. Watercress ignored the climate when he could. Only when the wind scraped the snow across his bare face and stung his eyes did he flinch, and it was so cold at times that he wasn't sure what dripped down his philtrum, salty mucus or dusty snowflakes. If possible, he would want to find something to cover the rest of his exposed skin by the time they left Ikasu. The temperatures in Gia were legendary for being even more treacherous than Vetron. Instead of facing flurries and fluffy snow, they'd fight hail and iced paths. Since Watercress was in the second line, there were piles of fresh snow to shuffle around below his feet. His boots, durable cloth sewn together with braided twine, clotted with freezing patches of water. As soon as the frigid fabric abraded his flesh, he shuddered. The chill ran up his legs and echoed through his fingers. He shoved his gloved fingers under the waistband of his trousers on either side of his hips. For his toes, he cast a spell around both feet that kept his blood's temperature above hypothermic conditions. Watercress regretted not training further with weather magic. If he had, he could have warmed the entire caravan. While Watercress could maintain a barrier of health to ward off illness among the whole party, he could not maintain healing and weather magic simultaneously for a group of roughly 2,000. If the soldiers bunched up, he might succeed in maintaining smaller hemispherical barriers. But for now, the snaking shape of the crusade limited the protection he could provide. Theoretically, if he had enough encapsulated fire pepper, he could use herbs to warm the entire crusade party, but that was entirely impractical. Perhaps he would meet with the weather mage along their route 
and learn some new piece of sorcery or purchase a spell tome. After a few dozen steps struggling through the snow, his blood pulsed through his body, and he decided it was going to be a manageable hike to Tahal after all. Unfortunately, the Ovalon region did not have a weather mage either, but a pine forest blocked the wind, and fires could shut out the brisk temperatures when indoors. There would also be a cobbler within one of the towns, and a fertilized set of boots would be a better alternative to keep out the cold. Watercress, if you'll enlighten me, the brigadier general said after exchanging a full conversation with F7 regarding military strategy. I'm dreadfully curious what the mage's words are. I've been interested in them since I was a child. If you desire to believe in such a fabrication, you can, Watercress answered, not keen on sharing his knowledge of the subject with any of the surrounding knights. Do you know what the words are? No. But a mage must know the secret of his discipline to be considered a proper master by the others. It's only a myth. I don't believe it. It's the secret of magic, is it not? The brigadier general said eagerly. You can think that if you want. That's a yes. Watercress wasn't going to give away his knowledge to anyone, not even Basil until it was time. So what is it? As far as I know, the words don't exist. Watercress, you would not have been selected to be the healing mage of the capital city of Vetron if the other healing mages did not respect you. Honestly, Watercress said, it had nothing to do with the other mages. Master Annis chose me when I was a child because I was a sorcerer and possessed the phantom sight. King Citrine contracted me afterwards because of my performance at the mages' college and my master's recommendation. But if you were inadequate, you would have been replaced. The same will go for Basil unless he reveals his reputation as a wizard to be false, as you claim. I do not know what you are suggesting, sir, Watercress said. The Major General tilted his head toward their conversation, but said nothing. The Brigadier General smiled personably. It was indeed the smile of a lord's son. Why nothing at all? There is only disillusionment in the Mage's words, Watercress said finally. The soldiers behind him whispered their complaints about the flurry and their desire to return to their home's hearth. While Watercress marched, he looked to the sky. There wasn't much to see, but he could get lost in the endless sea of ancient clouds, smooth like the snowbanks they would soon deposit. If any of the Arkspawn of old had an eye watching over the kingdom, Watercress believed such a gray was the iris, observing objectively, without discretion or pleasure, bland, unfeeling, perfectly neutral. Scanning the skyline, Watercress identified a black silhouette gazing upon the long train of travelers. More than likely, the animal did not understand the migration behaviors of humans, and it posed no threat. Watercrest turned his attention to the steeper hills ahead of the assembly and hoped they would reach to Hall before nightfall. It would prove to be an impossible task without Master Azimuth's assistance, but he prayed to Hingsuk the Blessed that some miracle might stumble across them. <laughs>